Back in May of 2010, while in desperate need of cash, I agreed to house sit for one of my old high school teachers. He had contacted me via Facebook and asked me if I would be willing to water his plants, collect his mail, and clean out the place while he went out of town for a couple of days. He didn't specify where he was going, but he agreed to pay me $400 for two and a half days, with half up front, so I agreed. I never really liked him in high school. He was teaching classic literature, and he always seemed to enjoy pointing out any illustrations that in any way featured nudity. His eyes always seemed hungry, and he tended to wheeze like he was out of breath, even though he was kind of a small guy. My friends and I used to refer to him as Mr. Lip Tip. When I arrived at his place, the key was beneath the mat, and $200 were in an envelope on the ground floor, and I made myself dinner. I found his house to be extremely boring. It was filled with old books, stacks of newspapers, and ancient looking furniture that didn't really look comfortable to sit in. I settled into my sleeping bag on the guest bed, but I had a hard time staying asleep. It seemed that every five minutes there was another strange noise coming from the house, and it would put me on edge. The following morning, I went back to my own house, had breakfast, and took a shower before coming back and cleaning the second floor. Upon entering the guest bedroom, there was the faint smell of something in the air that definitely had not been there before. And what's more, I could have sworn that my sleeping bag was in a slightly different position when I had left it that morning. I started getting a bad vibe. I decided that night that I would sleep downstairs in the living room. I finished cleaning just after 10 p.m. I made some popcorn and enjoyed some cable TV, which I didn't have at my place. Around 11, I shut off the TV, wrapped myself up in my sleeping bag, and tried to drift off. I was tossing and turning for a bit. Just as I began to doze off, there came a click of the doorknob turning in the other room. I glanced over and I swear by any god you choose. Mr. Licktack emerged from the pantry wearing only his socks. He then slowly turned the corner and made his way upstairs. I grabbed my phone and my keys and exited out the back door quietly. I ran around front to get into my car and sped home, where I immediately called the cops. I didn't know exactly how to explain the situation to them. I mean, he wasn't breaking and entering. It was his house. But when I explained to the operator that he had deceived me into thinking that he was gone, they sent out a patrol car. I had to collect the stuff that I had left at his house anyway. When the police arrived, Mr. Littak answered the door wearing my sleeping bag over his shoulders. The police discovered a butler's cupboard, which was a secret room in the pantry that I wasn't aware of where he had been hiding with a digital camera. He had taken a few dozen photos of me all around the house, most of which when I was sleeping. I showed the police the Facebook messages he sent me, assuring me that he would be out of town, and they arrested him. I collected all my remaining stuff but left the sleeping bag. I didn't waste any time getting a restraining order against him. Mr. Littak made bail, but actually died of a heart attack a few weeks later after being rear-ended in his car at a stoplight. I never got the rest of my money. During the spring of 2004, I was 19, even though I looked about 14. I was 5'0 and weighed about 100 pounds. That's if I was carrying laundry. My parents and aunt were vacationing in Mexico. I had decided to opt out and house sit for my aunt. I figured it would be a nice opportunity to have a quiet place to study for my upcoming exams. And all I really had to do was clean the pool, collect the mail, and restock the fridge with groceries. I also had a plan of action that involved emptying her safe and rescuing her car in the event of wildfires. Her place was high up in the hills of Southern California, with a terrific view of Long Beach. I mostly spent my time in the massage chair in the guest bedroom, playing music in the background while I poured over my psychology notes. Occasionally, I would sit out on the balcony and work on my tan, or use the treadmill in the basement, but I mostly was secluded in the air conditioning trying to be productive. Every night, I would set the alarm and make sure the security cameras were working before I went to bed. But on the fourth night of my stay, I was really focused on the books and forgot to set the alarm after it got dark. At about 1.30 am, I paused to take a break. That's when I realized how late it was. My stomach sank as I remembered that the basement door was unlocked and I had to secure it before setting the alarm. Before heading downstairs, I wandered into the study to get a look at the security cameras just to be safe. I remember thinking to myself, what are the chances that someone may actually be inside the house? As soon as I finished processing that thought, I saw the figure on the basement stairs. I remembered my mouth falling open and making a small croaking sound. There was a middle-aged balding man with glasses slowly making his way up the stairs, and to make the situation even more unnerving, 
In one of his hands, he was holding a balloon. I stared at the cameras as he reached the top of the basement stairs and looked around before cautiously setting foot into the kitchen. My first thought was to slam the door, lock it, and call the cops. But deep down, I knew it would take the police between 10 and 12 minutes just to make it out here. And in that time, this guy could easily overpower me and drag me into the night. I suppose I could have hidden somewhere as well. But I didn't like the idea of trying to stay quiet while he wandered from room to room searching for me. Instead, I decided to go on the offensive and try something, and it was both incredibly daring and amazingly stupid. I tipped him back into my room, turned up the music, and then made a loud production of exiting the room, pounding my feet down the hall. I called out as loud as possible, Marcus. I swear I heard something downstairs. Put on your shirt and grab the key to the gun cabinet. I was positive my voice was quivering as I said it, but I figured the music playing in the background would hide that fact well enough. I paused for a few seconds, waiting to see if he would call my bluff, but when all I heard was the silence from down below, I power walked back into the study, locked the door, and checked the cameras. Sure enough, he was scampering out of the basement door like a frightened squirrel. I watched him run across the backyard or run the pool and disappear between the hedges. As soon as he was clear of the house, he let go of the balloon, and I watched it from my window as it lazily flittered away towards the Pacific. I ran downstairs, locked the basement door, set the alarm, and called the cops. I also called my parents and aunt and told them what happened, asking them how I could rewind the footage to show the police. My aunt asked me why I didn't just hit the panic alarm on the security pad, and I had to admit that I hadn't even thought of that. To make a long story short, the police caught the guy a week later. He was sleeping in his car in the grocery store parking lot. Everyone always asked me what I thought the balloon was all about, and if I had to guess, I think it was a gift. This guy must have seen me a few times outside the house, surmised that I was alone, and assumed I was much younger than I really was. I have no idea if the guy is still in prison, but regardless of where he is, I kind of hope he hears this and feels stupid. He got scared away by nothing but the empty threat of a panicked girl with the strength of a man or a sturbo. So this happened last year when I was house sitting for my neighbor. He was in the hospital for a few days recovering from surgery and I had been asked to stay in the house and keep an eye on his cats. The house was pretty small, but it was on a nice wide open property by the woods, and there was a tiny swinging cat flap on the kitchen door where the cats could come and go as they please. The flap led into a screened in back porch, and the house only had one bedroom, so I chose to sleep on the couch in the living room. After cleaning up, feeding the cats and watching some TV, I shut off all the lights and laid back on the couch. I had my phone out and was casually scrolling through Facebook when I heard the flap swinging back and forth. From where I was in the living room, I couldn't see the door because the counter was in the way, but I glanced over to see where the cats scamper over and leap up on my legs. I gave it a welcoming pat on the head and continued scrolling. After another minute, I heard the cat door make a noise again, a soft squeak. This time I didn't even glance over, figuring it was the second cat following the first into the house. Another few moments passed, then I heard the squeaking again and after another moment it squeaked a third time. I looked up from my phone wondering why the second cat was jumping in and out like that. I was wondering if I would have to scoop it up and put it in the bedroom. The door continued to squeak for another couple of minutes as the second cat continued to jump in and out. I finally decided that I had enough. I put my phone down and sat up on the couch. I began to stretch. As I did, I happened to glance behind the couch and my blood froze. The second cat was curled up in its bed in the corner, and the first cat was still nestled between my legs. My confusion turned to fear instantly. Was there another animal on the back porch? Another cat, maybe? I slowly stood up and carefully made my way over to the back door, tiptoeing across the carpet in my socks. The door made a squeaking noise again. I peered around the counter and felt the sensation of my heart leaping up into my throat, and at the same moment, my stomach dropped. By the faint rays of the night light in the hallway, I saw an arm reaching through the cat door, straining to get at the knob. The fingertips were brushing at the lock. For a few short seconds, all I could do was stare in terror. Frozen by the surreal silent reality of what I was experiencing, it almost didn't feel real. The severity of the situation hit me, and I realized that if the intruder got in, I wasn't going to stand a chance. I grabbed a large two-pronged fork that was used for flitting sticks on a grill, and in one swift motion, I stabbed at the arm right below the wrist as hard as I could. There came a thunderous scream of pain from the other side of the door and the arm was immediately retracted through the flap. But the fork had impaled the intruder 
so the cart itself on the door. That produced a second loud scream, and the arm was wrenched violently outside. I heard the clatter of the fork on the ground, and then I heard footsteps sprint across the back porch and out the screen door. I immediately turned on the outside lights and caught the glimpse of a figure running towards the woods. Instead of calling the cops, I scooped up both cats, stuffed them into the same carrier, grabbed my phone and my shoes, and sprinted out to my car which was thankfully parked inside the garage. I drove up the road a couple of miles to my place, and once I was safely inside I called the cops. It took them half an hour to get to my place, and then another half hour questioning before they continued down the road to check out my neighbor's house. They told me that there was no sign that the screen door had been broken into, and aside from the bloodstains, there was no sign of the intruder. They put out an alert to local hospitals for a man with a stab wound on his right arm. The following morning, police brought a dog out to follow the scent, but whoever the lucky bastard was, he was never caught. I kept the cats at my place until my neighbor was out of the hospital. It still shakes me to my soul, the idea that the stranger chose that house in the middle of nowhere trying to get inside, and if I hadn't got off the couch when I did, this may have ended very differently. I work as a food delivery driver during my first few years of college. Mainly, I would drive for DoorDash or Uber Eats. I didn't like making small talk with strangers and didn't want random people in my car, so I preferred delivering food over being a normal Uber driver. I did this for over a year with pretty much no issues, aside from the occasional customer mad that the restaurant messed up their order. Anyways, it was late Wednesday night and I didn't have any classes in the morning, so I decided to make an extra few bucks and deliver for a little bit. I did four or five quick orders and ended up about 20 minutes from my dorm. It was about 1 am now and I figured I should probably end it there and head back. The way the delivery apps work is pretty much you just drive around and wait for a random order to and then it will give you an estimate of how much you'll make and how far it is. Then you either accept or decline it. On my way back, I left that app running just in case there was a really quick delivery nearby. I got a few requests, but they were a bit too far and didn't seem worth it to me. But then another one popped up just as I was pulling into my dorm. It was about 12 miles away. The payout was really big. I would never seen anyone offer that much money before. I gave it some thought as it was pretty far, but it was too much money to pass up. I accepted the offer and started the directions to the restaurant. A few minutes later, I arrived and pulled up their order so I could make sure I picked up the right stuff. As I walked through the doors, I noticed the customer had only ordered two items and the total was only over $6. This was really unusual as typically the high paying orders are because of large deliveries of expensive food. This meant that they were just giving me a really big tip. I got the food and went back to the car. During the drive there, I was really just trying to understand why they would give such a big tip for such a small order. It was a little weird, but honestly I just came to the conclusion that it was either just a mistake or they were trying to be kind. Although 12 miles wasn't too far from my campus, I had actually never been to this area. It was really nice with mostly gated off neighborhood communities and huge houses. Luckily their house wasn't gated and then I was able to just pull into the neighborhood. I looked at the homes as I passed by and realized that the tip money made a lot more sense now. The street was long though and I was just a couple minutes from the house when the customer sent me a text through the app. It told me to make sure I delivered the food to the right address when I pulled up. I figured maybe the map showed his neighbor's house or something so when I arrived. I sent him a text with a description of the house and asked if that was the right one. He replied no and I waited for a little bit expecting him to describe his house for me, but he never did. I sent him another text describing his neighbor's house to which he replied no again. I was starting to get pretty annoyed with this guy and tried calling him instead, but he refused to answer. He would ring a few times and then he declined the call. I looked at the address again and then copied and pasted it into Google to try and look it up there. Doing this, I actually noticed that the number for the address wasn't a regular number. It had a subset of numbers on it. I'd never seen this before and wasn't even sure what it meant, so I searched the address on Google and looked at the results. When I zoomed in on the map, I saw that the address actually pointed to a spot right in between the two houses. Zooming in further, it looked like there was a really small garage or maybe even a shed. It was barely visible. I looked up from my phone and moved my eyes to between the two houses and sure enough, it was a small garage like structure. It was just a few feet from the main house that my delivery app brought me to. I honestly wasn't sure what to expect or why someone would even live there. But I already came this far so I wasn't about to walk away now. So I got out and started heading over. As I walked up the driveway I could clearly see what the place was. 
It was pretty much just a large storage garage, probably meant for keeping an old car or something. I didn't see any normal door though, so I put the bag down by the garage door. As I began taking my phone out to take a picture for the app, a man came around the right side of the garage. I looked over at him and he just stood still staring at me. The guy was really creeping me out, so I said, it's right here for you, sir, as I pointed at the bag and slowly started walking away. Then he replied, telling me that this wasn't where he wanted me to drop it off. I turned around and noticed that he was still standing in the same spot. I'm sorry, where did you want me to put it? I said, starting to get really uneasy about the situation. He pointed around the back of the garage and said that the door was over there. At that point, there was no way I was going to follow that guy to wherever he was trying to get me to go. I just kind of stood there for a moment, then said sorry and quickly walked back to my car. I looked over one more time before driving away, and the man was walking back behind the garage, but he left a bag of food. I got out of there and drove back to my dorm, shaking the whole way back. Something about that whole thing felt very off, and the fact that it was in a really nice neighborhood made me even more confused. The more I thought about it though, I realized just how strange it was that he needed to specify for me not to deliver to the main house, and that he refused to take the food unless I followed him to behind the garage. I'd never had to call the police before in my whole life, and I ended up not calling them this time either, as I really wasn't sure if maybe he was just some weird harmless guy. Anyways, it freaked me out for a few days, but eventually I got over it and continued doing deliveries in my spare time. Nothing else happened, though a couple weeks later, I had another big order pop up on my app, and the area of delivery was the same. I obviously declined it, but I couldn't help but think about whoever ended up accepting that order, and what happened to them during their delivery.